Welcome everybody. Let's get started with lecture 24, which, as it so happens, is our last lecture on image processing. And what we're going to study today is, first and foremost, the idea of color spaces. And uh, towards the end of this lecture, we shall see a couple of applications. Um, up until now, we have mainly talked about uh, intensity images, just because it's, it's easier to talk about intensity images. But last time, we already began to talk about uh, color, uh, color images. And uh, up until now, we have studied a lot of transformations uh, for different purposes. Either we uh, transformed the whole image to um, a different domain, and in that domain we did something with the transformed images and then transformed them back and saw that they were magically filtered. And we also spent quite a lot of time on the idea of image warping. And those were transformations that were, well, um, not transformations of the whole image, but sort of transformations of the coordinates of the image. And when we are talking about applications of uh, color spaces, then we shall see yet another form of transformations, namely the idea of, uh, well, transforming actually not so much the um, uh, locations of pixels, but rather the values of pixels. And to get into the mood, let us briefly remind ourselves what we discussed last time. Uh, we looked into the notion of color and where it comes from. And uh, there are three major things we have to consider here. First of all, the uh, physical basis uh, or basics of what we call uh, light. It's electromagnetic radiation and uh, may have different frequencies or wavelengths. We saw that uh, light, which is you know, a fancy term for electromagnetic, uh, magnetic um, waves, um, has the well, property that mm, certain wavelengths or certain frequencies of these, these waves are being perceived differently by the human visual system. Uh, so that basically on the physical side of things, it is the uh, frequency or wavelength that causes color impression in our brains. And then there is this second aspect, which is basically the physiology of uh, color perception. And that is to say the biological um, composition of our eyes. You know, those are biological sensors. Uh, you can think of them as uh, system involving a lens, it's called the pupil, and then there are lots of nerve cells in the back of our eyeballs. And those eye, uh, nerve cells you know, sort of receive this incoming light, turn it into electrical impulses which are then forwarded to the brain where they are further processed. We saw that there are different kinds of nerve cells, rods and cones. We saw that uh, you know, some of these nerve cells are more or less focused on the uh, processing of intensities, that is sort of like the strength of the incoming light, whereas other nerve cells um, were reactive or are reactive to different kinds, again, of wavelength and frequency, so that um, not only based on the physics of color, but also sort of on the physiological basics of color, we can um, understand the idea of how the human visual system perceives different kinds of color. And then we talked about sort of the psychology of color perception. And I pointed out that by far the most important player in this whole sequence of sort of processing stages is indeed the brain. And from that point of view, we can look at this figure here. It is called the Dawood of the human vision. And um, <coughs> we talked about the idea of tristimulus theory, uh, where uh, humankind decided or, or, well, came up with the idea that since there are uh, three different kinds of nerve cells responsible for the perception of color, 
it appears that any color we can see might be a uh, combination of certain basic colors. We have to be careful when we um, discuss this idea because it's not entirely true. We talked about this last time. But what we can see here <coughs> is a representation of all the colors the average person can see. This is important. Every, like if some of you don't see lots of colors here, then uh, that may as well be. Right? But um, statistically, the average person sees about uh, all the colors present in this figure. Uh, what we can see here is an X and a Y coordinate. And we discussed this idea of representing colors in terms of three, uh, say, basis vectors. Um, and we discussed the idea uh, underlying this CXYY color space. And in this representation, the capital Y, one of these three basis vectors, uh, has been chosen the, the amount of sort of information along this third basis direction has been chosen such that this point here, this white spot, the white point, is supposed to correspond to daylight. So what we see here is actually a slice through a three-dimensional object. And uh, typically, we only discuss this two-dimensional slice through this uh, three-dimensional object. Uh, we discussed many, many properties of this thing. For instance, that this uh, curved outer boundary is called the spectral locus because that is where we find the pure colors, the most saturated colors, or um, sort of those colors that correspond to light waves of a single uh, wavelength, say 460 nanometers, or 560, 580, 900. So along this curved boundary, we find the pure colors. Then there is this very special thing here, this straight line at the, let's say, uh, lower right of this figure. And that is called the line of purples. And I pointed out that uh, these colors <laughs> physically do not exist. Right? Because uh, looking at the curved boundary, we see that it goes from a wavelength of 380 nanometers up to 700 nanometers, and therefore basically maps the uh, visible spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, that is that part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is visible to the human visual, visible, uh, vision system. Uh, those pure colors, physically pure light, is uh, arranged around here, and then there is a smooth transition from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. And that is something that is done by your brain. So these colors do not have a physical counterpart. There is no pure light that would uh, create this color impression. It is basically done in your brain. So in that sense, this line of purples is really special. And um, just from looking at the figure, we see that it is not perfectly triangular. And, uh, well, that uh, should already raise concern in the sense that this idea of tree stimulus theory is maybe not entirely correct. Because you could, of course, um, select basis uh, vector somewhere out here so that they would indeed form a triangular object that would contain all of this. Um, but if we were to do so, then there would be large parts in this figure that are not visible to the human visual system. So it's, uh, yeah, we have to be careful. And uh, indeed, this is not even a linear space. I mean, we can immediately see that from its shape. But um, look at this, I have singled out three points in this gamut of human vision and they are spaced equally far apart so the distance from this point to this one is the same as the distance from this point to this one however the range of colors uh, we would traverse if we were to move along this line from here to here is rather uh, uniform it's basically different shades of green 
Whereas if we move the same uh, line length from this point to this point, we would actually see a lot of different colors uh, if we you know, were a tiny, tiny hand moving from here to here and look around and see our environment change dramatically. So uh, this is an indicator for the fact that perception of color is not a linear phenomenon and that is to say that even if we were to assume that there's basically three basic color directions or let's say we talk about color in a three-dimensional vector space with three basis vectors um, what we see is not a purely linear combination of these basic colors and um, all of this we talked about how this figure and the C X Y Y color space have been created, and uh, that was an attempt to objectify this highly subjective uh, phenomenon of color perception. And uh, now that it has, you know, been done in, in psychological or perceptual experiments, and, and sort of statistical averages have been considered to come up with this figure, it looks as if that was something very objective. But this is not the case. Um, in particular, there are certain effects, again, uh, perceptual effects. Uh, you, your brain sort of does automatically, unconsciously, you don't even realize that, um, which hmm, evolved over time because as human beings, we, uh, up until 6,000 years ago, uh, you know, were, were living out out in nature and had to survive out in nature and uh, that required certain capabilities um, and many of the of the visual illusions we know basically have to do with the fact that our brains uh, try to produce a consistent interpretation of our environment and uh, one of the fascinating examples in this context is, for instance, given by this figure, uh, where we see a checkerboard um, and an object placed on the checkerboard and this object casts a shadow and uh, two of the fields of the checkerboard have been singled out, field A and field B, and I spent quite a lot of uh, time to try to convince you that A and B have the exact same color. Did you check that at home? Did you download the image, open it with an image viewer, move the mouse over these squares and saw that indeed the three color values indicated by your image viewer somewhere around here are exactly the same as somewhere around here? Did you do that? I really encourage you to do that. Um, because even if we superimpose this uh, rectangular shape here, this, like, this is what I did, um, it does not look as if it was of constant color, but it is. And uh, the fact that we do see a gradient from darker to brighter here is again something that is done by your brain. Because your brain sees that and has to realize, oh, this is a checkerboard. And a checkerboard has dark and bright spots or squares. And um, this thing is a bright square. And it looks uh, slightly darker than the other bright squares because it is in the shadow of this green cylinder. And for your brain, that is all that matters. And uh, in order to sort of produce this interpretation, it is actually a good thing for your brain to see these two squares in different colors because otherwise uh, you would not see the checkerboard as it is. Right? So indeed, these are things. These are... Um, cognitive processes, uh, higher order cognitive processes, deep reasoning about nature and the world that surrounds us that your brain does automatically. And uh, these processes are actually good for survival, right? even though we would consider them a bug nowadays. But uh, actually those are features rather than bugs. So that was what we had been discussing last time, physical, physiological and psychological basics of the perception of color. And today we will look into uh, 
well, technical approaches towards the problem of representing color. And here is the first technical approach. And um, let me ever so briefly switch back to this overview slide. See, all of what is to follow now is basically subsumed under the heading color spaces. Why would I talk about color spaces? Well, this figure gives it away. What we can see here is basically a three dimensional space where I have singled out, I don't know, an origin and three basic or basis directions. And uh, just from looking at this figure, we of course see that in this case, uh, the angle between any two of these basis vectors is 90 degrees, so they are orthogonal. Right? This is a visualization of the RGB color space. And it's called RGB because one typically assumes that the directions of the three basis vectors that span this space coincide with, hmm, well, I don't know, the direction of red color impressions, green color impressions, and blue color impressions. And as with any vector space, we can think of an arbitrary point, let's say somewhere here, as a linear combination over these three, in our case, basis vectors. Right? So a color C can be understood as a vector, three-dimensional vector, with components R, G, and B. And these three components indicate sort of the um, extension along the red axis, the green axis, and the blue axis. And the um, eight colors situated on the corners or vertices of this cube are in a sense special. So we have red, green, and blue. We have black, which uh, corresponds to the origin. If there is a zero in the direction of red, a zero in the direction of green, and a zero in the direction of blue, well then, there is no color that is black. Right. Let me go here. <coughs> Quite often, we may think of this, it's, it's, you know, it's a cube. And um, as, as a cube, it has a maximum extension along all three axes. Uh, and we may scale it. We may scale it such that this point along the red direction would correspond to a value of one. This point along the green direction would correspond to a value of one. And this point along the blue direction would correspond to a value of 1. This is what this line is supposed to say. Why would that be interesting? Well, because a scaling like that would turn the RGB color space into what is called a unit cube. Right? Uh, can be easily dealt with mathematically. Of course, in the memory of our computers, when we uh, typically, I have to say, um, process color images. These values are not scaled to a maximum value of 1, but to what? 255, exactly. Right? So, um, in the value of your computers, this would be a value of 255 along the red direction and correspondingly for the other one. Now then, of course, um, the white point here would be well, either value of 1, 1, or 1 along all three axes. So it's like uh, it's the corner of this cube diagonally opposed to the origin. Either those would be 3, 1, or 3 times uh, 255. And that, again, depends on how your computer represents colors. Right? And of course, it really does not matter. Um, it, it makes a slight technical difference if Colors are represented in terms of integers between 0 and 255 or in terms of floats between 0 and 1. But uh, mathematically, that's really not, not of importance. Uh, if it is scaled like this, then the RGB color space can be thought of as the unit cube. And uh, 
color space is a very, you know, strong term here because uh, just from looking at the figure, we see it's just sort of a tiny part of the whole space. In particular, there are no negative color values here. So even though these things are called color spaces, they basically are geometric objects. That is something you have to keep in mind. So be slightly critical about what you read. It's not really a space, but it's, you know, it's terminology that, that is commonly accepted. Um, this line segment from here to here, so this diagonal in this cube going from the origin to the white point, is called the neutral axis. Would you have any idea as to why that is? Where would we find a gray color in this cube? Hmm? Along this diagonal axis, right? Because, um, say, if the um, contribution along the red, green, and blue direction is exactly the same, then that would indicate a point on this diagonal. And um, those are, you know, colors we don't really perceive as colors. They are something very dark or something very bright, but basically something gray to us. So gray values are found along this diagonal here, and it's called the neutral axis. Um, we also talked about the idea of um, additive and subtractive representation or mixtures of color. We saw that, um, especially for printing, might be an interesting idea to compose different colors in a subtractive manner um, because there's a difference between surface colors and emitted colors, so active um, uh, color sources such as the projector here, or color sources where uh, light of certain, so say my sweater, light of certain um, wavelength or frequencies is absorbed and only a part of all the spectrum that is incident to my sweater is being reflected. So in that sense, this, this brownish color of my sweater would be a surface color. And uh, in your computers, it's quite interesting to represent colors in terms of these uh, basis vectors, sine, magenta, and yellow, a yellow because uh, that can indeed be very helpful if you're creating digital images that are supposed to be printed. And the transformation between the red, green, and blue color space, the RGB color space, and the CMYK color space is particularly simple. Note that uh, this time I'm using 255 instead of 1 for the maximum color, but if we do want to get uh, CMY, cyan magenta yellow, representation of the color. Given an RGB representation, all we have to do is compute uh, this difference between the white point, let me go back to here, the white point and the corresponding color vector. And that would give us a representation in terms of C, M, and Y, right? Yeah, basically just flipping along uh, Okay, um, and that's good and well, we don't really, you know, it's good to see that, but I guess you will hardly ever really need that. Um, and that is, again, because typically all the software you are using uh, does all the worrying for you, right? There are different ideas as to how we could represent colors using uh, technical devices. And another color space is called VYUE, or UV, and this one is tuned to the idea, or to the fact we discussed last time, that the human visual system is very sensitive when it comes to the perception of brightness information. It's more sensitive towards perceiving something as being dark or bright than to perceiving, say, the saturation or hue of a color. So chromaticities are something we cannot quite as accurately distinguish as brightness values. 
And um, this can be represented technically if, let me see, um, we represent a triplet of numbers, we will all say, uh, again, we assume that, that colors can be represented in terms of three numbers. Instead of using R, G, and B, we might consider the brightness, uh, and it's called Y. And do not ask me why it's called I really don't know. This, this you know, it's, it's called Y. And the brightness can be computed, say, if you're given the R, G, and B values of a color, like this. So we have 0.3 times R plus 0.59 times G and uh, plus 0.11 times B. Why would these coefficients, 0 0.3, 0 0.59, 0 0.11, be chosen like this? What, what could be the reason for that? How many rods are there that are sensitive to blue light? Not so many, right? About 12% of all of them. And this, this is reflected here. So the fact that we have nerve cells that are sensitive to, well, <laughs> different, to really careful here, there's no, not, no such thing as colors physically, but the fact that we have uh, three different kinds of nerve cells sensitive to different um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and that they are not like sort of equally distributed in number but uh, there are more nerve cells that perceive a yellowish greenish light and uh, more that perceive a yellowish reddish light than that would perceive blue light is expressed here. So the intensity that is the brightness of a color is actually really uh, dominated sort of uh, by the amount of green we see or by the fact that we have more nerve cells that would respond to light of a wavelength that we would call green. Now if brightness is represented like that um, then there are two numbers coordinates left to represent uh, uh, chromaticities and in this representation it is done like this, uh, number U measures the difference of a certain color um, with respect to its redness and this number V measures the difference like, with respect to its blueness and um, color spaces like this play a certain role in um, um, yeah, radio, uh, in the television technology transmission of, of radio signals, uh, it's indeed much, much more important to get the impression of intensity right than to get the uh, accurate colors as accurate as possible. It's, it's more, for us as human beings, it would be more disturbing to, to see an image that is not entirely correct with respect to its overall brightness um, and, and I don't know, distortions or, or missing information with respect to chromaticities, that can be easily handled by your brain. Right. So this is where these kind of color spaces are important. Um, and again, this is basically good uh, to have seen once, but not really important for, I don't know, your daily life. Now, uh, here is something much more interesting for uh, those of you who will or are interested in all of this and would like to continue studying these uh, kind of things that have to do with image processing, I have to point out that the three representations of color that we have discussed so far today have been you know, uh, designed purely with technical aspects in mind. And by that I mean um, that none of these color spaces would actually allow us, none of these we have seen so far, to talk about the way how we actually see color. That is like a 
bright, saturated red. It's easier for me to talk to you about, you know, this is a really dark red than about uh, this is a color um, 0.8 times R plus, um, I don't know, 0.1 times D plus 0.1 times G. But this, this, it doesn't make sense to us. We like to talk about things, you know, this is, this is really reddish, bluish, yellowish, and this is, is, is a yellow that is, you know, really a saturated yellow rather than a pastelish yellow. So what, what can we do to capture the way human beings talk about colors? Uh, how can we map that to mathematical models that we can use on our computers? Well, we have to think about different representations of uh, colors um, and basically that boils down to the problem of thinking about different geometric objects when we talk about color spaces. Again, uh, are rather geometric objects than real spaces, but look at this. This is the so-called HSI cylinder and here we think about uh, a color as a point in this cylindrical object and the color is therefore basically characterized by its intensity see there's an eye along this, this axis the central axis of the uh, cylinder uh, and intensities may go from something very dark to something very bright and then we have the saturation this is basically to say colors that would be situated close to this axis are rather pastelly are not so pure, they are not so such a dark red. If we were to, I don't know, look a point in, in this angular direction here along, say, the saturation dimension of the cylinder, it would be, I don't know, something rosé, stuff like that. that. It would be a red with lots of white in it. So, um, so we have intensity and saturation, and then we have the U. And that is, this is again like, you know, a mapping of the um, visible spectrum of the <coughs> pure colors along the spectrum we see to an angle this time. And let me go back um, to this figure here. You see, um, there's a lot of fantasy. We, we can, you know, topologically this is a circle. It does not look like a circle and geometrically it's not, but we can, you know, bend it and then it becomes a circle. So you can basically, again, really like um, assign these, these wavelength here to, to angular values. And this is what happens here. This is what happens here. Typically in this representation of color, uh, the uh, coordinates is, is a, probably a dangerous term here, but let's call them coordinates. The I and S coordinates are measured in terms of numbers in the interval from 0 to 1. And the U, that is the kind of color we are talking about, is measured as an angle between 0 and 360 degree. Of course, could also be 2 pi, but uh, this is, this is what, what's done typically. Okay, let us look at... Um, uh, okay, should I read this here? Yeah, I already said, like, something that is down here in the cylinder is rather dark, stuff up here is rather bright, so intensities increase from the bottom to the top, saturation increases from the uh, central axis to the outside of the cylinder, and um, complementary colors, I never talked about complementary colors so far, but uh, I guess it's not really important, are 180 degrees apart. But what I really wanted to talk about is how we could compute an HSI representation of a color if we are given its RGB coordinates. And this is uh, how we could do this. So uh, first of all, for the sake of simplicity, we assume that the RGB values have been scaled such that their maximum value is, is one along all these possible directions. So basically we talk about the unit cube. And now 
Um, we can think of the transformation from RGB coordinates to HSI coordinates as follows. First, we may rotate the cube by an angle phi such that the yellow corner lies on top of the red direction. And this is what this matrix does here. This is a rotation matrix and it rotates the RGB color values such that if we were you know, particularly to rotate this uh, point here, it would coincide with the red axis. Then in the second step, we now could rotate this already rotated cube once more by an angle of theta about the green axis. Uh, this time we would choose theta such that the white corner of the RGB cube coincides with the blue axis. It's the second step and it's another rotation. This rotation is encoded by this matrix here. And then we finally, given all these intermediate coordinates, so in the first step we obtain intermediate coordinates R prime, G prime, B prime. In the second step we do something with these intermediate coordinates and obtain R2 prime, G2 prime, B2 prime. And then in the third step we finally compute the H, S and I coordinates based on the two prime coordinates. And um, yeah, there is not much I can illustrate here. It's basically this is how you would uh, turn these uh, three-dimensional coordinates with respect to, uh, I don't know, a orthogonal basis system into cylindrical coordinates. There is not much to be said here. So this is how we could transit from RGB to HSI. And this is a very peculiar transformation because we note that for every RGB color, there is an HSI color. Does this hold the other way around? Is there an RGB color for every HSI color? No. Why not? Let's look at this and mentally sort of draw a cube in here and then you see that there are certain regions in this cylinder uh, that are not inside this cube. Or mentally, you know, put a cylinder above this cube and you see that within this cylinder there are certain coordinates that do not lie within this cube. So this is something we have to keep in mind that transiting from RGB to HSI, we can rest assured that every RGB color is indeed mapped to an HSI color. However, the other way around, that may not be the case. Here is another interesting question. Is the transformation from the RGB space to the HSI space a linear transformation? Involves lots of matrix, uh, matrix operations, right? Could be, we could be tempted to think that this is, you know, basically something linear, but <laughs> it's not. So this is this is, uh, and it's actually this is the reason why you know we have an HSI color for every RGB color, but not the other way around, because sort of in the last step of this chain of transformations, there are highly nonlinear functions involved. The transformation from RGB to HSI is not linear. Is that something we should be concerned about? Actually not, because it's maybe even a good thing. This, you know, this, this, this gamut of human vision is something that is really not linear. And if we want to represent colors in a coordinate system for which we believe that it is closer to the way humans perceive colors than these technically motivated uh, 
coordinate systems such as RGB or YUV, um, then it's, it's probably a good thing that these transformations involve nonlinear computations. Right? The take home message is transformation from RGB to HSI is not linear. Okay, uh, here is yet another idea of how colors could be represented. Um, in this HSI cylinder, there are lots of um, points or coordinates do not really have a RGB um, equivalent. So one you know, may simplify this model a bit. And uh, this color space, it's again a geometric object that's called a color space. It's called the HSV space. The difference is basically that what was called the intensity axis now is called V axis. And this is basically to distinguish them and there is no deeper reason as to why it's called V now. But we have the same idea. We have uh, sort of the idea that intensities are expressed in terms of the height of a point in this uh, well, pyramidal shape, and that saturations are expressed in terms of the distance to this uh, neutral axis here, and that views are expressed in terms of, a, of an angle. And uh, there you see a top view. Say you, you know, were a bird and you fly from this uh, bottom point to the top point somewhere, and then look down, and then this is what you would see. This is what you see. This is funny because this is also what you would see um, if you were a bird and would, let me go back here, um, fly along this axis to somewhere out here and then look down. It would actually be exactly the same picture as this one on the right. And um, this just repeats what I just said. And here is um, how you transit from RGB to HSV coordinates, done in Python. And I will not discuss that. And I would actually really seriously hope that any software you ever use in your life has these things built in. If you ever have to do it for yourself, then uh, you know here it is. Um, we can go back from HSV to RGB. This is basically the inverse transformation. And I will not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Not discuss it. Um, let us instead discuss yet another color space. And this one is on, uh, uh, say, of theoretical interest, rather. Uh, this one is called Psi LAB, and I have no idea why it has stars, but it has stars, so it's uh, Psi L star, A star, B star. Um, here the basic components are lightness, uh, red greenness, and yellow blueness, and um, geometrically this thing is a sphere. This thing is a sphere, so now instead of cylindrical coordinates, we can think of um, a color in terms of a spherical coordinate. Uh, one of the directions within this sphere, again, sort of indicates dark to bright, and the other two directions indicate, yeah, it's not pure colors anymore, but yellow greenness and, uh, ye or red greenness and yellow blueness. Um, this one is interesting because uh, this addresses the problem we talked uh, talked about earlier, namely the fact that in this um, <coughs> gamut of human vision, uh, if we travel a certain distance from one point to another and then the same distance from that new point to yet another point, we may perceive different sort of amounts of changes of the colors along this, this path. And if this gamut of human vision is further you know, transformed such that it coincides with a sphere, and we can do this because uh, topologically it is a sphere, 
Uh, so why not, you know, turn it here into a geometric sphere? Uh, if we do this in this new color space, it's actually indeed that um, if you travel a certain distance twice, the amount of change along these two subparts will always be the same. So this, this color space addresses the problem uh, we talked about with respect to the um, gamut of human vision. And let me briefly show you how we would transit from RGB representations to LAB representations. And the reason why I'm transiting from RGB to all these other spaces is because RGB is how images usually occur if you, you know, take a snapshot with your camera and then record it on uh, your um, memory chip and then uh, move it to your computer. You're typically dealing with RGB images. Uh, that is a very nice way of representing them. Technically, if we want to turn that into something that is more amenable to the human visual system, we have to go to HSV, HSI or LAB. Transition from RGB to LAB is done like this. First, we have another of these uh, crazy um, sort of weighted transitions where you compute x, y, z coordinates. Those are actually the x, y, z coordinates we talked about last time. Um, so this would actually be the transition from R, G, and B color representations into this x, y, z space we talked about last time. Once we are there, we do know that it's slightly distorted geometrically, so it has to <laughs> be adapted, and the adaption can be done like this. And um, again, uh, yeah, all right. If you ever have to do it and it's not available in some library, here is how you would do it. And I um, shouldn't say that, but let's forget about this for now. Right? It can be done. That is the take home message. It can be done, but we don't really need that. The, the again, more important thing is that this is a sphere and that this uh, representation of color sort of corrects the geometric distortions in this uh, gamut of human, human vision. And this is, in, uh, this is of, of certain practical interest um, and we'll study the reasons why in the next semester when we talk about image analysis. Quite often when we want to automatically analyze images, they are given in terms of RGB coordinates or, or RGB color pixels. And people look for um, dominant colors right? and they apply clustering algorithms and these clustering algorithms, I don't know, identify the six most dominant colors in this image and they apply this to the RGB color values and then they get uh, ugly darkish, brownish, grayish colors. And this is crazy because we as human beings would not see these six ugly darkish, brownish, grayish colors as the most dominant colors in there. But this is because we as human beings do not see those images in terms of RGB coordinates. So if you want to analyze images, say, do color analysis, it is really a good idea to first transform the color representation into one of the representations we just talked about. And uh, this one is, is actually very interesting because um, here the, the distance between one point in this sphere I look from here to here and then from here to here. That would actually really correspond to the difference how people perceive these colors. The other uh, color spaces, that is not necessarily the case. So I don't know, uh, distance from here to here and here to here may still um, cause different perceptions of what you see. And in that regard, this is an interesting color space. However, uh, the technical details are not really interesting to us. Instead, let us use uh, the remainder of today's lecture um, to see what kind of funny things we can do now that we can represent colors in terms of three coordinates in some space. Um, first of all, Let's uh, think about HSV in, uh, representations of colors and uh, look at what happens if we do something with the H value 
of all the colors in an image. And again, like an image says a thousand words, picture says a thousand words. Here, look, this is the original. And um, of course, in memory of my computer, it's usually given as an RGB image, but I can translate it to an a HSV image. And once uh, we have translated the RGB representation into an HSV representation, what I did, I added 120 to every H value in the image. And this is what we get. And now they're green. Why are they green now? Let me go back to here. I don't know. So, um, say their skin color is, what is it, somewhere here? Is that human skin color? I don't know. Is that? So we add 120 degrees to it, we end up here. And this is exactly what we saw. The interesting thing about this is that you can use that to change the color content of an image without affecting the brightness. Because, you know, if you, if you I don't know, some point somewhere here, you just add 120, you, you do not move <coughs> along the brightness direction and you do not change the saturation. If you were to add some R value to an RGB pixel, it may end up with a different brightness and, and uh, saturation, right? If we do that with HSV coordinates, the image on the right-hand side, if we were to compute the intensity representation of this, has exactly the same intensity than the image on the left. Of course, um, instead of playing with the uh, U-value of an image, we may also <coughs> consider the saturation of colors. Um, and again, pictures have a thousand words. Here now they have um, uh, spent some time on a uh, uh, sunscreen. Uh, I just you know, multiplied the saturation of all the HSV coordinates uh, by a factor of four, and now they are much more saturated darker colors. The blue is much sort of bluer than it, it would have much, but uh, see here, this, this is the original blue, and if we multiply its saturation coordinate by four, we get this. Uh, same goes for the skin, and so on and so forth. Nothing changes actually with respect to everything that is black in this image, because black pixels would, oops, reside down here. This is zero, that we, we can, this is the zero, zero coordinate, so it may corresponding to these values. If we multiply zero, it's something, nothing happens. Um, so there you go. And on the right hand side, I decrease the saturation just sort of by dividing the S values by two. You can use whatever you want. Right? You can use whatever you want. Okay, um, in the two examples we have seen so far, these kind of manipulations have been applied to all the pixels in the image. That does not have to be the case. We can just as well apply these kind of color transformations to only certain pixels in the image. Um, and that is what I mean by can be carried out conditionally. So, for instance, um, we may change the saturation only for those pixels whose U is within a certain angular range. Not for all of them, just for, you know, some of them. And if we do that, we can, for instance, turn skies into deeper blues or grass into deeper greens. And I have to warn you once more, if you flip through the pages of a travel catalog, Never trust them. Right. And uh, here is an example. So this is the Great Wall of China, as, as uh, seen usually. But um, we may just as well turn the sky into our sky today. Um, or, I don't know, um, we could you know, make it even bluer. There is no problem here. Um, these two transformations have been applied to all the pixels where the H value of the HSV coordinate uh, was found to be in the interval from 100 
80 degree to 300 degrees. Right? So uh, this just goes to show you that you can turn skies into whatever shades of blue you like. And um, if uh, you do not like the color, you may, you know, again, of, of the walls, uh, you can, you know, set it to a different color value. For instance, here, I have turned this into something grayish. This basically, I, I removed every saturation information. Set it to zero, it becomes a gray pixel. Or I may, you know, intensify the um, stone color here, say by multiplying the saturation by four. Here, uh, these transformations have been applied to pixels in the uh, U range between 20 and 80 degrees. Let's quickly verify what that is. So um, 20 and 80 is probably like from here to here. So everything that is uh, reddish, yellowish, brownish, something like this-ish, <laughs> uh, that was um, manipulated. And indeed this is reddish, brownish, yellowish and only pixels sort of with a U between 20 and 80 percent uh, degrees have been manipulated here. Right. And this is trivial, trivial. And so really, um, especially in, in, uh, in the tourism industry, never ever trust any of the pictures you see. All right, so um, that is actually all I wanted to tell you um, for today because uh, I thought we have a short FAQ once we are done. Let's briefly recap what we know right now. Um, we have talked about a couple of technically motivated color spaces. RGB and CMYK are uh, of importance in uh, representing colors on your computers. Uh, CMYK is important if you want to you know, um, pass any image you'd like to be printed to a professional print shop, they very much would like you to have it in, uh, or present it in CNYK. We also, ever so briefly talked about the uh, YUV color space because that plays a certain role in television technology. And then we talked about perceptually motivated color spaces, these representations of colors that um, are supposed to be closer to the way uh, we as human beings would talk about colors, right? Something dark, something bright, something uh, reddish, something bluish, uh, and something really uh, of a saturated red or not so saturated red. Um, we looked into a couple of transformations between color spaces, and they were basically transformations starting with the RGB coordinates and then transiting to the other coordinates. Uh, that, of course, does not have to be the way. We can, you know, look into the transformation between any of these color spaces. Uh, once again, uh, the images you are dealing with are typically given in terms of RGB uh, color representations. So now you know how to transit from RGB to a couple of other representations. And then um, some funny examples of how these color manipulations could be used to, again, tamper with images and turn them into something that is not really there but uh, might be preferable if it was there so do not believe any pictures you see in any media that is all i have for today are there questions regarding today's lecture no okay so then i'll uh, switch off the microphone and camera and we'll talk about possible questions you may have given this uh, self-test. Thank you.